Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for taking time to really join us in this uh, fine weekend afternoon. Um, I don't know, maybe it's weekend or uh, good morning. Uh, it depends upon your time zone, but uh, yeah, it's 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 afternoon um, in Singapore. So uh, a very warm welcome to you all. And um, uh, this is Anthony here. So I am the moderator of this session. So. Uh, before before uh, moving to other parts, let me share a short uh, intro about me. So I did my master's in National University of Singapore, and um, uh, I am in the software industry for like over uh, 10 years, primarily focusing on full stack web application development. Uh, I also do enjoy uh, working on mobile app development, uh, which is where I really entered into the world of Flutter development as well. So later in the session, uh, we will have a word about Flutter, uh, some basic intro to it. So please stay tuned. And um, uh, yeah, that, that's mostly about me. So let me uh, walk through with you guys a very short intro about the session. So today's session is primarily broken into two parts, where uh, first Crimsy will cover uh, some practical tips uh, for your first tech interview. Uh, this session, this this part of the session will cover 45 minutes, uh, and then it's followed by a 15 minutes Q&A. Uh, then uh, we will move on to the next part where Prakar will share his uh, practical experience into mobile app development world. Um, similar to the first part, uh, this will also cover 45 minutes max, and then um, uh, uh, the, the session will move on to have uh, 15 minutes uh, Q&A. Uh, so please, uh, I request you please to raise your questions in the chats or in the question uh, panel that you have, and we will try our best to answer them. Yeah, that's mostly about the talk, uh, about the session intro. So now let's uh, move on to the talk, uh, where uh, first in line we have uh, Crimzy sharing her practical experiences for your first tech interview. So a little bit about Crimsy. Uh, she started her career as an Android engineer and is still continuing her career in mobile app development world. Um, she holds fresh experiences about mobile app development in FinTech space and is really very happy to share her experiences with you all. So uh, let's all invite Crimsy to share her tips. Crimsy, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, yeah, let me share my screen here. Uh, can you see the screen now yeah <laughs> i'll be talking about uh how to land uh your first tech job after your graduation and um, most of the students when they are almost graduating or on the last uh, year of studying they have their own like dream companies so uh and when we're talking about dream company and when i ask people what is your dream company where you want to work and uh, its usual answer looks like this. It's Airbnb, Netflix, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and the other um, great companies. And uh, when uh, and the, the following questions, when the following questions come, like why exactly that company is your dream company, <laughs> most of the people don't have uh, the right explanation or criteria or idea behind of the company, why it is dream company. The answer is like, oh, it's Google, like, oh, it's Twitter, like, <laughs> or, and uh, there is nothing when we can really understand if the company suits you or you suits the company. And um, all these uh, struggles uh, brought up to me as uh, the idea to research as uh, the explanation of what is dream company. So when we talk about dream companies, this is the three basic uh, criteria that I found uh, works for all companies. It's company development and company culture and opportunity to grow in the company. So if we are talking detailed about each criteria, company development means company history and how and what would you associate with, for example, if we're talking about like Amazon, it's market, a market it's door-to-door -door delivery, or if we're talking about Twitter, it's news. If uh, we're talking about YouTube, it's YouTube videos. And uh, if we are talking about Grab startup, it's drivers <laughs> and deliveries. And if we're talking about company cultures, the so second point, uh, it's daily environment of the company. It's people whom you're going to eat lunch with, um, people who are going to work every day almost eight to 10 hours <laughs> and uh, it's your future friends and uh, 
and it's how you're going to feel in your new family, in your new company. The third part is opportunity to grow courses, trainings that company provides you. And because you are a fresh grad, you are going to learn from more senior people. And it, it matters with whom you're going to um, work and uh, who is going to be your mentor or which direction you're going to work, right? So maybe you would be asking like how I would know about company development, company history, and all the thing. So first of all, uh, you can read about company history and development from company's website, pages on LinkedIn and Facebook, and the company's blog would be different like in Medium or in Twitter or in any other platforms, not only in company's website. Or maybe some interviews from founders of the company, like you can find in YouTube or like in some podcast, for example. This is our company's LinkedIn page. So all this, you can follow company and I read the latest news, understand the culture of the company, and maybe uh, you, you could see how company grows. The second point is company culture. Where do you know? Where do you learn about company? It's, you can see that in Glassdoor, company pages and LinkedIn as well, and the employee pages on LinkedIn, then you can follow experts, professionals who work in this company uh, via LinkedIn. So for example, if you're interested in mobile development, you can follow all the experts who is working in the company, mobile experts. Or if you're interested in business analytics, you can follow the expert from that company, or all business experts, and start to understand the, the way how they're working and what they're liking, what kind of news they're sharing and other activities. So uh, this is, uh, as example, I used our company as ratings. And in Glassdoor, it's not only just you can see the uh, reviews about company. You can as well see the interview tips or like other people who even didn't get an offer, leave the uh, review. So you uh, sit and read and get some kind of picture of what company is. And why I've mentioned that you need to follow employees who's working on that company. So. This is an example. And uh, maybe in companies pages, you, you don't feel that it's really 100% true information because company does marketing, it's uh, PR, and a lot of teams are working on it. But when employee posts something, it is more truthful information because employees, it's real, uh, they're real people and they are posting in their own page what they feel and what they think and what they like. <laughs> And if we talk about opportunity to grow, uh, you could ask about opportunity to grow during the interview from HR or interviewer, then employees pages on LinkedIn as well. So you can see what kind of certificates they are earning, uh, what kind of uh, free webinars they're doing. And uh, maybe you could read as well from Glassdoor review and company pages in, on LinkedIn and Facebook. And uh, when you do all these three steps, it will take maybe few months to figure out what kind of company suits you. And it doesn't have to be big company, even if you're interested to do a lot of things and you want to find something dynamic, maybe startups are good for you. But you have, for example, five to 10, your dream companies. <laughs> and what to do next? And why should company hire you? Because every year people are graduating from universities and there are so many fresh grads. So you have to be unique that people that company, your dream company, hire you. So what is your uniqueness? It's your uh, GitHub projects. Uh, it's your practice in lead code. Uh, it's your hackathons. And uh, it's your research that you have done just now. Like, you know the company, you know the culture, you have read some blogs, uh, you know what you're looking for, and uh, you could explain why you're a good fit to this company. And why I'm talking about hackathons here as well. Every year, there are like on the world, like 180 plus hackathons for students. And the hackathons might be stressful because it, it requires 24 to 4, 48 hours your energy, your collaboration, and it's kind of stressful. But hackathons will give you an experience to work as a team, to present yourself, and you will try to different kind of technologies. Maybe it for one hackathon, so you will be working as mobile engineer. For another, you would be as project manager. For third, you will be drawing design. Then uh, to trying different kind of technologies, you would understand 
what is interesting to you? Uh, what do you like to do? Okay. So if you get an interview invite, here is the things that you need to do before you go to the interview. It's the cracking the coding interview book. Is a, I could say that it's Bible of the uh, fresh grads <laughs> before going interview. Second, do mock interview with your friends. So you could just real interview and give feedbacks. Uh, it will help you to prepare your presentation um, to ask to answer the questions in proper way. Second, um, prepare cover letter, even though when you're submitting your resume or CV for job, a uh, cover letter doesn't require, but having one of it shows that you're interested in this posi position and you have, and a very, very uh, important advice, please have a very good sleep, uh, have a rest. If you don't sleep, uh, maybe you would be so stressed up, you will forget everything you know, and you, you would end up to fail the interview. What to do during the interview? Uh, first, have fun. Um, the interviewer is usually going to be a more experienced person than you. Uh, and uh, talking to smarter and experienced people than you, it's always fun and it's always new experience. You will learn a lot of things. Second, uh, be yourself. Uh, don't pretend to be someone else. Just relax. And last but not least, uh, advice it's ask questions. Uh, maybe after graduation or like right now in your life, you're not sure what to do or you're not sure what technology are interesting to you. All these questions, it's appropriate to ask <laughs> the interviewer and uh, prepare your questions um, before you go to the interview because um, asking the right questions makes the interviewer to remember you. Maybe some questions make them laugh, <laughs> some questions really make them think that my favorite question was like, would you advise for younger self? <laughs> and um, uh, these questions was, wasn't expected for interviewer and they had to think and um, tell the advisors that uh, he or she would tell to younger herself. And all these advisors I tried to use in my life. <laughs> and it was kind of interview slash a lesson. Please remember that interview is not only one process side, it's two process side. While in, uh, company is interviewing yourself, uh, you are interviewing company and uh, you always can say no after the offer if you don't like something. And thank you for attention. I hope these tips helps you in the future. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Grimsy, for this uh, wonderful uh, talk. Actually, it was really good that you, you portrayed two sides of the interview. One on uh, uh, why should um, I, as a, as a person, choose a company and uh, on the other side, why as a company should choose you? So it, it was a very good contrasting uh, explanation on both sides. Um, I hope students, uh, uh, the participants should find it uh, really useful. Um, so uh, just a reminder again, uh, please post your uh, questions in the Q&A panel where uh, uh, the the speaker can uh, answer your questions. Uh, yeah, please get it going, and uh, I will help to moderate the questions as well. So in the in the meantime, when uh, uh, participants are uh, posting their questions, I have one question for you, Krimzi. So uh, my question is usually what um, what I would or or usually when I was uh, in my younger self. I usually look for all those um, big, big companies like uh, like what you mentioned, like Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, or even there were a few, few other companies that were big shots during the time of mine. Uh, but however, what happened is that naturally we end up in this uh, place where it is a competitive market and there are many startups joining uh, the industry. And um, what what would you or what would you what would be the advice? If I happen to encounter a company, which is a startup, but they have an emerging uh, new tech. So how should I approach uh, that particular situation? Startups uh, are usually always uh, require the people who are hungry to learn something. So even if you don't know uh, this technology, this new technology, um, you could show that you're hungry and you're ready to learn and you can uh, sit over the weekend and take a courses and show that you're interested, show that you're ready to learn. And I think this approach would help 
are you to be unique from others uh, fresh grads <laughs> yeah good 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 that's that's a kind of a value right <laughs> good good so actually which which uh, which drives me um into a, a similar next question about a value so so when 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 the fresh grads or, or the people who are entering into this corporate world when they look at a company's culture uh, and the values what is the what is the uh, biggest value that you got attracted to in your past uh, it's opportunity to grow and um, sharing is caring because um you can uh, learn something on yourself but when um, you're doing it with group and with your colleagues uh, you can learn even more because you can get you will get feedback you will have different point of view and uh, uh, this is a my uh, most valuable uh, company's culture for me <laughs> okay wonderful wonderful thanks thanks for that explanation um so that's mostly we have and uh, again another reminder for the participants please if you have any questions about the interview or um, uh, what are the uh, tips or any additional tips that you need you can or a particular tips for a particular situation you can uh, always post that in the q a panel yeah so we have a question here how did you choose your path in tech my my past in tech it, it wasn't really uh, solid uh, thinking uh, it i was i just won scholarship in tech university <laughs> and then my my one question was like can i animate something with programming and the answer was yes then i just <laughs> uh, choose the major as I, I in it <laughs> that's it but i end up ended up liking it a lot <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I have some some similar um, points to add on to to that is based on um, so for for me some similar experience. This how did I choose my path? Uh, uh, is because during after graduation I was looking into what is the emerging uh, uh, tech uh, or emerging uh, stack that needs uh, a lot of uh, resources or a lot of people and what could be the game changer in the next uh, few years. So that's an important uh, point for me to like uh, to take my direction. So similarly for, uh, uh, for for people who are entering the tech world, please look into some tech technologies or some uh, innovative ideas that are going to uh, change uh, the world. And a very good example I would say is green energy. If you notice the world now everywhere, it's uh, the, the, the topic that would be hot is green energy. So as long as you can research a lot about uh, green energy and uh, particular tech uh, innovations in the green energy, and if you happen to enter that world, yeah, that, that, that the future is yours. You're going to change the world a lot. So that can actually help you to guide a path. This is, this is again, a, a long-term vision. But yeah, similarly, in this, in this view, you can actually um, research uh, about the world, the, the current trends, and then you can choose your path. OK. Um, let me let me let me uh, look at the questions that we have. <laughs> this, is, this is a funny question here. How do you master data structures and algorithms for interviews? <laughs> this is always a challenging <laughs> question to answer. Yeah, um, um, uh, there is a course in Coursera from Stanford University uh, plus a lead code. Just practice. <laughs> and uh, what uh, what would you uh, guys? Uh, advice Prakar and Anthony. Yeah, 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 How similarly. <laughs> master that. Yeah, similarly. I mean, uh, for me, when I when I did it, uh, what I did, what I began with is like practice some problems. And, um, you know, mostly in algorithms, uh, though, though the question is very complicated, what I what I initially happened to solve is just brute force it. Yes, just arrive to a solution. Once you do a lot of solutioning then you will know how to optimize it and how to how to make an algorithm that is suited for that particular problem statement so that's 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 my view and uh, yeah of course practice a lot of uh, uh, problems really really um, having hands-on would help you and you prakar <laughs> um i think for sure practice is, is the most important thing um but i would start with the theory first um you know learn about what data structures and algorithms are 
um why are why are they important to programming i think that's important to know and um just i mean the, the knowledge that it really does improve your code and makes everything more efficient um just should motivate you enough to want to practice um writing some you know data structures writing some algorithms and once you have the practical knowledge going into an interview should be should be a breeze okay well um uh, do we have some more time guys uh before we move on to the next session yes we have uh, one more question here um yeah Okay, sure, sure. So uh, another question, uh, this is more of a uh, uh, yes or no question, but I think we, we, will, we will be able to elaborate to, to the students here. The question is, do, you, uh, do we experience uh, burnout uh, in, in the tech uh, world? So Krimzi, you wanna take it or? Uh... I think burnout can happen ev everywhere, but um, uh, having a work-life balance, proper work-life balance helps you uh, to be on track yeah uh, what about you guys <laughs> i think it depends on the 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 place you're working for as well um there are places where burnouts are more likely in startups in maybe smaller companies where they expect the developers to work longer hours um so some larger companies may be a bit more lenient but again yeah it depends on the job um and i mean ideally if you're in a position where burnout is possible um you know there are there are many ways we can kind of avoid it um, um, that you could probably find online. <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to inform about that. Yeah, Anthony. Uh, yeah. So usually when I'm doing um, things with a lot of passion, uh, with learning and um, you know uh, interest interest to solve challenges, I don't usually face burnouts. Because it's 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 based on still your passion, right? So you don't really feel the burnout. You're you're still enjoying the moment. But uh, there are situations where I really feel burnout when um, when I couldn't even get a break from it uh, for a very long time. So example, I'm still enjoying the moments, but uh, it feels like it is a rhythm for me for quite some time. Then I start to get boring. So that's where you need to you need to uh, look into uh, your feelings as well. So if you are really getting into that feeling, first thing is yeah, approach your uh, immediate manager or seek some help from the company itself because company as well don't want uh, uh, us to burn out and then uh, we leave the company. The, no, no, no company in the world needs that. So if we feel it, uh, if we are doing works based on our passion, we can still continue. But at the moment when, you, when we feel we are a uh, bit, uh, we, we just uh, overused ourselves, then that is the time we need to, stop for a while, think, and then uh, we need to approach uh, or seek help from our uh, company as well. So we are, we as colleagues, we will help each other. Cool, I think, uh, yeah, let's let's uh, hold uh, it here. Uh, so other questions, I think we can answer them uh, later. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me, let me uh, move on uh, with the next part. So next in line, we have our guest speaker, Prakar, who holds an engineering degree. Uh, from the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Prakar is also focusing heavily uh, on front-end mobile app development. Uh, so he has uh, mostly his career into uh, various uh, frameworks and uh, uh, various native applications. So I think Prakar will also share his introduction a bit more detail. So without further ado, let me invite Prakar to share his experiences and tech insights. Prakar. Oh, thank you, thank you, Anthony. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen first, give me a second. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, yes. We cool. Can. Um, so when I was approached um, to give this talk, I was initially going to make it very technical, uh, trying to explain the details of mobile app development. But I realized that um, if I was in a position of possibly entering this, in, this industry, um, I would probably want to know more of an experience uh, to make things a bit more interesting. So what I'm going to do in my talk is I'm going to give you some examples of um, basically stories of how I journeyed into mobile app development um, from my university until um, the job that I do today. And um, in between, I'm going to try to give as much technical details on mobile development as possible. Um, it's going to be basic for now, but uh, hopefully in future sessions, we can dig deeper into the tech. Um, before I start, I want to give out a poll um let me just go back to zoom 
Okay, so I, I wanted more information about the participants joining today. Um, I will give you about 15 seconds to kind of answer this question, uh, just to have an idea on where you are at the moment. Um, so maybe if I'm talking, I can kind of cater to this, to your audience. Cool, looks like uh, most of us are from university. Some of us are just graduating um, and some of us have been working for a while. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll right here then. Share results. Okay, so about 50% are from university. Um, people have been work, working for a while as well and just graduated, graduating soon. Others could be, I don't know, maybe school or something. Not sure, but okay, so thank you for that. I will stop this poll and I'll go back to my presentation. Cool, so a little background about myself. Um, I grew up in a large Asian city. Um, I've always been a little interested in tech and have been creative. You know, I've been playing around with Photoshop and you know, creating little comics um, growing up, but I never really made a conscious decision about what I wanted to do for university. Um, I was just looking at universities and I found a course that I thought sounded cool, which was energy engineering. And um, it wasn't something I enjoyed. So I spent about a year or two years doing energy engineering and was you know, slacking off on my assignments because I just didn't enjoy them very much. Um, so what I started doing on the side was I started learning programming and that's how I kind of stayed productive. Um, I also started taking a lot of tech courses uh, from university and all of, if I had any free courses left for that semester. Now, what I learned from that uh, second story, you know, that, that part of my, my career, my journey, it's that it's okay to not like what you're doing. I mean, sometimes we make this, this decision uh, of going to university and studying something and we don't end up liking it and that's fine. Um, but it, it's important to, for, for us to continue to work to change it. Um, so after, after my university, I mean, during my university, um, I was in my third year and I, it was time for my first internship. Um, in my first internship, I, I met a friend who, was, um, uh, who knew someone who was looking for uh, someone who create, to create a website for them. And I went into this interview and was very honest with the person, with the CEO of this company, of this startup that I was applying for. And he asked me if I knew how to create a website. And I said, no, I have no idea. I even told him that I have no pro practical programming experience. So I've never actually developed anything. I've just learned theory. Um, and that was an important thing that I learned. Um, I'll come to that later. But basically during this in in internship, I learned web development and that's how I became a, a front-end developer. And I'll get into what front-end development is. Um, so the important thing that I learned there was that practical knowledge is super important. Um, in the beginning, I was just focusing on theory, learning language syntax and learning how uh, programming languages work, but I wasn't practicing anything. And that was probably a mistake uh, because if I had practiced something, I would have been a lot more confident going into, into that internship. Um, but that was a good lesson learned. Um, and I would suggest if you are in university or you are you know, applying for new jobs to build something to, um, if you're applying, if you're tr trying to become a mobile developer, build a mobile app. Um, just so you have enough practice. It doesn't have to be a very, um, you know, detailed application, but something just to get you started and to make you, to help you feel a bit more comfortable getting into this, this, this job. Okay, so what is front-end development? Front-end is the side of the platform that faces the user, right? So we have things like mobile applications. So that could be Instagram on your phone. Uh, it could be a website like facebook.com uh, that you open on your browser. Um, it could also be a TV app. So if you open up Netflix on your smart TV, that is also a front-end application. And all of these things are built by front-end developers. So the time comes to my next story segment, my family project. Um, so me and a lot of people around me were using iPhones and I had this bright idea of creating an iOS application. Um, I was also very interested in travel. So this application was a travel-based iOS native application. I'll get into, get into what native means. Um, and I built this application, you know, I, I spent a lot of time learning on how to do this. Um, and I went into my final year project interview. So it was like a, um, my final session, it was a presentation in front of three judges. And um, it was very interesting. So I was very confident getting into this because I had built this application that I loved. Um, it looked decent. And I went into the interview and the first question they asked me, so I have the slides up and I have a screenshot of my application. The first question they asked me is, show me the design of your application. 
and I was a little confused. Um, I didn't understand what exactly they meant because the screenshot was on the screen. So I just started explaining where the buttons were and where the text inputs were and all of that stuff. And um, they looked at me very confused as well. And they were like, no, we don't mean UI. So they meant, we don't mean the user interface. What we mean by design is we want to see your software design. And unfortunately I had no idea how to answer that question. Um, I just, I shrugged and I ended up doing not very well in my final year project, although I passed. So that was good. Um, I was able to graduate, but it, it taught me an important lesson. Um, an important lesson was that theoretical knowledge is what helps you um, communicate, communicate your code with people around you, with other tech people around you, and also helps you build it really well. Um, it, it was important for me, what I realized was it was so important for me to be able to communicate how I built this application, and I didn't have the vocabulary to do so. And I knew if I had spent more time in the theory of iOS app development, is I would have been able to do that. And I would have been able to build the application in a more sustainable, more maintainable way, uh, which I did not do. Uh, looking back at the code of that application, it is not very good, but it's fine for someone who just started off, but it's an important lesson I learned um, and I wanted to share. So what is mobile app development? Um, the development of mobile applications is um, basically applications that run on your mobile device. Um, that, that means the two major operating systems that work today are Android and iOS. Uh, there are other operating systems as well, um, Windows, um, you know, Linux, uh, but these are the two most popular ones. Um, there are also many different ways to develop mobile applications for these different operating systems. Um, there is native development, there is hybrid development, there's instant apps. I will get into the details of all of these in the future. And a very important thing I want to point out about the mobile app development space is that there is a strong shift in many different industries uh, to be mobile first. In the past, um, major corporations would build um, websites and focus on the websites, but now it's all about the applications. And this is very important uh, because if you're getting into mobile app development space, this is gonna be a very beneficial thing to know. So what is native mobile app development? Um, native mobile app development is development of mobile applications using natively provided, uh, using tools natively provided by the operating systems. So that means uh, Google provides the Android SDK. SDK stands for Software Developers Kit. Uh, which is a kit that you use to create Android applications. And Apple provides the iOS SDK. Uh, what this means is you, you use one code base and you build an iOS application using the tools provided by Apple and you do the same for Android. Now, the benefits of this is um, of mobile native mobile app development is that they're usually very performant because you're directly using the tools provided by the operating system uh, platforms. Uh, they're also very stable for the same reasons. Um, they are um, very well looked after these tools are very well looked after by Apple and by Google. And they're easy to update and maintain because all um, any operating system updates uh, make sure that the tools are updated as well. Um, but some of the drawbacks uh, for, these, for this native mobile app development is that it could be slower to develop. And it's possible that it requires more developers to develop because in this scenario, if you're building an iOS and Android application, which is pretty standard, you would um, need two different code bases and ideally two different developers or more so um, in native development, this iOS app development, what that is, is basically development for the iOS operating system um, that is owned by Apple. And the tools that you would use, the programming languages that you would use are Swift. Uh, Objective-C was used in the past and might be still used in some older projects today. So that's important to learn if you're getting to iOS development. The IDE, uh, which is the interactive developers environment, which basically is where you write the code is Xcode and it's limited to Xcode because Apple owns Xcode as well. Okay, so that brings me to the next segment of my story, uh, my first job and the phase one of my first job. So I entered the job and I was fortunate to get, the, get um, a job in the place I interned at. Uh, it was a small tech startup, but this time they hired a CTO who was doing my interview um, and I'd never met him before. And during the interview, he said he asked me if I was open to creating a hybrid app using Ionic or Cordova. And again, I told him I have no idea how to do that. I've never done that in my life. And um, but I was very honest with him. I told him very clearly that I, I you know, these, these are my skill sets. Um, but I'm very open to learning. And fortunately, I got the job, um, and I started building an Ionic uh, Cordova hybrid application. And what I learned from this is it's very important to be honest about what you don't know. Um, if you're joining a new job, if you're starting a new position, be honest. Um, if you hide it, they won't, I mean, you might not get the job, you might get the job, but you might not be able to, uh, they might not help you as much to learn something new. 
but if you're honest about it you, you may get the job and when if you do you know the the firm that you're applying for will definitely go all out to help you learn the technology that's needed and of course it's very important to be excited to learn as well you know if you have the motivation to learn um it becomes easier to to pick up something new cool so you heard hybrid mobile app deployment what exactly is that so development of mobile apps um, for multiple operating systems with just one code base is called hybrid mobile app development. Um, so that, that means that if you write one code, um, if, you, if you have one code base where you're writing code, uh, you can then deploy it for an iOS application and for an Android application. Um, you know, there are many benefits to this. Um, it can be faster to develop um, because, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's one code base, so you're writing less code overall. And also, it can re require a few developers. So it's possible that um, lesser developers are required. Maybe only one developer for both platforms because you're adding only one code. Um, but some of the drawbacks is that you know it's less performant because usually how this how hybrid development works is there is a layer between the developer and the different SDKs provided by the iOS and Android. Um, so it makes things uh, a bit less performant. Um, it also tends to be less stable um, because the these frameworks that help you build hybrid applications uh, tend to be um, owned by smaller companies, and it's possible that more more bugs exist in this uh, these frameworks. And another drawback is that it's not as easy to update and maintain, um, you know, because updating um, like iOS could update a new iOS version, but then for this framework to make it work with that iOS version, it might take, take them some time, some time. So that makes it a bit less easy to up, update and maintain um, your applications. Um, so in hybrid, I spoke about Cordova and Ionic is what I use. Uh, there's also something called React Native. So there are many tools that exist in this community to, to make hybrid app development easier. So what Cordova is, is basically a wrapper around the native SDKs, uh, the layer that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it makes it easy to access native features. So what Cordova does is it creates um, an interface which allows developers to um, access, let's say the cameras or the um, audio equipment, audio hardware on a mobile device on both iOS and Android um, in just one, one method. So you can just use that one method and you are able to use both Android and iOS as camera. Uh, so it makes it really easy for us to do so. Um, something similar is React Native, which is probably the most popular one uh, today for hybrid app development. Uh, it is a tool created by Facebook. And what it does is allow, it does something very similar to Cordova but it also helps you use a React JS framework to build the uh, hybrid application. Um, the tools you would use if you're building a hybrid, hybrid application with the tools that I mentioned above is the programming languages, JavaScript or TypeScript. TypeScript is basically the same as JavaScript, but a bit more um, strong typing involved. Uh, and the UI, the user interface is developed in HTML and CSS, which are all web technologies. Cool, so that brings me to the next segment of my story. Um, before I start this, I just want to remind everyone that uh, if you have any questions at all, um, please put them in the Q&A below, and I will answer them at the end of this, this conversation. Okay, so the second, the next segment, right? The, this is the first job, um, phase two. In my first job, phase two, I was asked to create a native Android app. So what happened was my company initially, when it was a startup, uh, they built a hybrid application because they had fewer developers and they wanted to build applications for both Android and iOS, they were okay with it being less performant because all they wanted to do is gain market share. So these are some, some of the you know, positive things about using hybrid applications in small, in these environments. Um, but my startup has now been established, right? And they wanted to now build a performant application that our users would love and rate highly. So we were now going to a native. Um, I wanted to do iOS because I had done it in the past, but unfortunately they already had an iOS native developer. Um, so they asked me if I was ready to do an Android native app. Um, I was concerned initially, of course, because you know now I'm moving from these web technologies I was using and I'm gonna go to a native app development. Um, although I was very interested in Android development, I wanted to learn it. I was very happy about it, but I was hesitant. But anyway, I did it. Uh, I went into it. Um, and what I learned was just jump in headfirst uh i know you know when you're doing something new there's a lot of worry involved but what is important is to jump in do it um and then you know if you like it or not and if you don't like it it's time for you to go back to what you were doing before or maybe try something new but um if you like it then you've you know you've started a new career and because of that one decision i'm now an android developer i focus on android development um and i enjoy it very much cool so what is native android development 
it is basically development for the Android operating system that is owned by Google. Uh, the tools you would use for Android develop development are the programming language Kotlin, which has recently become very popular, but in the past they've used Java. So there are still a lot of Java projects on Android available. So if you're getting into Android development, I would suggest to start with Java and then do Kotlin afterwards. Um, the IDE that we use, um, if something that's promoted by Google is Android Studio, but of course, uh, with Android, there's more flexibility. Um, you can try different IDEs. Okay, so this is a, a bit of an analysis uh, of what I think iOS versus Android development is. Um, so on iOS, um, iOS tends to be more popular in developed regions like Singapore, Hong Kong, um, and Android tends to be more, more popular in developing regions, like India, Indonesia, and Android tends to have, uh, ha does have a larger market share than uh, iOS around the world. Um, in iOS, there are fewer devices, uh, there's less fragmentation. What that means is there are only a few iPhones available in the market at any one time. Um, and developing an application for iOS means that, you know, it's more likely for it to work on all these different uh, devices that the users have. On Android, it's a bit different because there's so many manufacturers producing Android phones that when you're building an Android application, it's, it's a bit tricky. Uh, you need to make sure that it works on most devices, if not all devices. And that means uh, that involves a lot of testing, a lot of um, you know, reading up materials online and all of that stuff. Uh, on iOS, there's less development flexibility. That means um, I iOS applications can only be developed on Macintosh machines. They can only be developed on Xcode and Apple kind of restricts that very much. On Android, there's more flexibility. So you can develop in multiple IDEs um, and um, you know, you can use basically any, any operating system to develop it, Macintosh or Windows. Um, iOS applications can only be developed through the app, delivered through the App Store, uh, whereas on Android, you can develop, de deliver APKs uh, many ways. You can do it to websites, you can do it through the Play Store. So it's easy to get into the hands of the consumer, and that's important. And another point that I wanted to mention that I felt important was that on iOS, users tend to spend more money on applications than on Android. And this tends to be a very important business decision. So if um, you know monetization is important, iOS apps tend to be uh, developed first. Okay, um, so that brings me to the last uh, story segment that I wanted to talk about, and that is my second job. Um, so I joined Zulke about a year and a half ago. And in this position, I was given the opportunity to learn. Um, that is part of you know, Zulke's ethos. And I was, I was very happy. Um, this meant that I could do one thing that I really wanted to do, which I was not able to do in the past, was I was able to prepare for the future. And what I did was I learned, I spent a lot of time learning Flutter, and I'll get into what that is um, later. But an important um, point I want to make about this story segment is preparing for the future is super important, especially in mobile app development. Uh, mobile app de development is quite young, um, started about you know a few decades ago. And um, if you're getting into the space, it's important to know what's what's next, uh, and you know do some research on that. I will go through a little bit of what I think is next as well, but. It's important to you know to to keep this in mind, and this might be true for other industries as well and other other jobs as well. Um, if you're prepared for the future, you know you're ready. You're ready for changes to come. Okay, so what is Flutter? Right, Flutter is also another hybrid development uh, app development tool, but it solves one problem that uh, exists with hybrid development is that you know the apps that you produce are not performant. Flutter apps tend to be a lot more performant than hybrid uh, apps written in other technologies. Uh, Flutter is owned by Google, and it's slowly gaining a lot of popularity. A lot of major corporations are moving applications to Flutter, and it's worth learning. Uh, the tech used in Flutter is a programming language, Dart. Um, the IDE choice is up to you on Flutter. So it's great that Flutter has support for a few IDEs, of course, uh, but it opens it up for you to use it with any IDE you like. Um, the one thing about Flutter that is that stands out from others is that it really promotes declarative UI development. Um, I won't go into the detail of what declarative UI development is, uh, but what I, what I would say is it is a more intuitive way to create UI. Um, maybe in a future chat, we can have a bit more detailed uh, communication about this, but for now, uh, it's important to know. And I personally think Flutter is probably one of the most enjoyable um, frameworks to use to develop mobile applications. So if you want to give it a try, I think this is a great opportunity. Um, and you will notice now the native development, actually, Android and iOS SDKs are now taking Flutter's um, you know, lead and also uh, adding declarative UI development in their frameworks 
using something called Jetpack Compose for Android and Swift UI for iOS. So what's the future, right? What is the future of mobile app development? Um, I, I think there are a few things um, that are important to highlight. There are instant apps, which is for Android and app clips for iOS. Uh, what these are are mini applications that perform just one or very few functions to let users quickly perform a task. What this means is uh, this, this app is downloaded. Uh, the user performs, let's say one calculation uh, on a calculator and then presses enter, gets the result and closes the app. The app is removed completely from the phone. So it's a very small um, bit that is added to the phone and is removed. And it, it means that the user doesn't have to waste time to install the app and go through all that processes. Um, another important thing I want to talk about is, this is a bit more subjective. Um, this is my personal opinion. But there is a strong move to web development possible as well in the future. Uh, this is because browsers are becoming extremely powerful now. Um, you, know, you, you can do a lot with the browsers that you wouldn't be able to do a few years ago. And some of them, sometimes browsers applications can be as performant as mobile applications. Uh, what that means is uh, some apps will start moving towards the browsers and allow um, you as a user to create shortcuts on your mobile device instead. So you will have the app icon on your phone, but as, you, as soon as you click it, you will be redirected to a website uh, where you can perform basically the same functions at the same um, speed and um, efficiency. Okay, so I'm going to quickly summarize um, this, this talk. Actually, before I summarize, I just want to ask a quick poll. Um, Give me a second. Okay, so I mean, you've, you've learned about hybrid development and um, native development. I just want to know which one are you guys most interested in? Um, you know, just want to understand what the opinions is. Um, I will give you about 15 seconds. Okay, cool. I'm going to end the poll over here and share the results. So it looks like about 67% are interested in hybrid development versus 33% on native mobile app development. Um, that's great. I mean, hybrid development is, I think, uh, gonna gain more and more popularity in the future, especially as more mobile OSs show up. Uh, but there is some importance of native mobile app development right now as well. And uh, it's good to see that this is, um, the, the, you know, there's some big interest in that as well. Um, yeah, I, I personally believe hybrid mobile app development can be more fun sometimes um, if you're not working with Ionic or you know any of the JavaScript frameworks. But Flutter and some future technologies are, are a lot more you know interesting. Cool. I'll just end that um, for now and move on to the summary. So to summarize uh, the conversation that I've had today, um, front end software development is what we've learned. Um, basically, anything that's facing the user. We've learned about two different types of mobile app development, that's native development and hybrid mobile app development. Under native development, we can create iOS applications and we can create Android applications. And under hybrid development, we can use Cordova and I or Ionic to create an application. We can use Flutter to create a hybrid application. And there's some possible future movements into uh, instant apps, apps, app clips, and some web first technologies. And I just want to quickly conclude um, all of all the topics that I mentioned today. Um, I know entering the front end world can be can feel intimidating, and I was extremely intimidated when I was first entering it. Um, I didn't know what to do, and you know I just jumped in. Um, I dived in headfirst, and I was honest about what I what I you know what I knew, and I kept I kept learning. Um, I think that was important. I think that, that that's what helped me um, get into what I like eventually, which is Android development. Another thing I want to mention is that both the practical and theoretical knowledge is super important. If you have more practical engineer experience and you spend a lot of time developing applications, I would suggest really to focus on some theoretical knowledge. Um, if you have done more theoretic theory, you've you know, taken a course in uh, your university, I would suggest start building something. Build a website, build an application. It doesn't have to be very good. Just build it first, and that's how you, you know, iterate and get, get better. Uh, the third point is mobile development is a very exciting space right now, and it's constantly changing and because it's very young. So if you're entering this, this market, you know, you're going to have a good time. Um, a lot of focus is being put on mobile development right now. And, you know, it's, it means that we are using some really good tools, some cutting edge tools. And lastly, mobile first right now means that there's a growing need for mobile developers in the industry. So if you're looking to apply for a mobile development role, there is a lot of scope out there especially in Singapore and Hong Kong. These are the markets that I know of, but I'm sure that exists around the world as well. Okay, I'm gonna open up the floor for some questions. I'm gonna answer the questions that are already there. Um, meanwhile, I just want to uh, mention that if there are some questions you still have, 
about entering mobile app development, about Android development, iOS development, whatever it may be, feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. Just send me a message and I will love to reply to you uh, and maybe give you some more insight if I can. Cool. Anthony? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Praka. Thanks for this uh, insightful talk. It was really uh, amazing to walk through uh, your, your journey while uh, you also share your uh, interesting experiences about the tech tech space as well. Uh, so yeah, let me let me bring the attention back to the question. So we do have one uh, which is primarily focusing on uh, Flutter. Uh, so the question is about what do you think about Flutter Web? Is it as cool as uh, Vue.js? But I would I would slightly tweak it to you know uh, put it in another words where. Uh, how do you think about Flutter Web and is it as cool as all those front end uh, technology uh, frameworks that we have, mm -hmm. like Flutter, React, uh, Angular, or any other front end frameworks? Right. Um, okay, so what I know about Flutter Web right now is it's just reached beta, um, which means it's not, I believe, not ready for production yet. Um, I've used Flutter Web a little bit. Um, unfortunately, I do not think it is as performant as building a of Vue.js or um, another framework like an Angular or React applica JS application. Um, Flutter web is can be great, but I think there's a lot of improvement left to be made. So the way Flutter develops uh, applications for the web is a bit different from how um, JavaScript works. Um, Flutter web is, you know, it's the pixels on the, on the browser are controlled by Flutter. And that's why it's a bit janky, especially with the scrolling. But uh, what I personally feel is if Flutter can fix those performance issues, Flutter Web is um, for me more enjoyable than Vue.js purely because now you have Flutter uh, widgets that can be reused in your mobile applications as well. So you now have just one code base and you can uh, run it on the web, you can run it on your mobile devices and it just works. But of course you have to make sure that it is, um, you know, the scalable, basically if you reduce the size of the screen, it still works. Um, yeah, that's that's my opinion of Flutter. Yeah. Great, great, great. Thanks, thanks. That that was really uh, an interesting explanation. Uh, we do have another one, um, which I, I didn't quite get it, but uh, Praga, do you want to take it? Uh, do we need the... algorithms of Flutter, right? Algorithms in Flutter, yes. Uh -huh. Okay, so what are algorithms, right? So they are basically functions that you write to make things um, to, to perform a specific task, right? So you write an algorithm to perform this task in a very um, performant way and um, in a very efficient way. Now, this is needed everywhere. This is needed in um, mobile development. This is needed in backend development and this is needed in many different spaces. But um, it is a bit less needed in front-end development. That, that, that's for sure. Um, I don't write algorithms on a daily basis. Um, but if I'm building an application that requires a lot of computation, um, some specific, uh, you know, functionality that I cannot just use something that already exists, then I would need to write algorithms. So yes, Flutter development might require alg algorithms, but it depends on the complexity of the application that you're trying to create. Great. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. And now uh, uh, we do have one other question, uh, which is coming up uh, with the increasing popularity of hybrid development. Do you think the demand for native app development still remain high? Uh, I'm very interested in becoming an iOS developer in the future. Um, so this is a, a tough, tough answer, unfortunately. Um, I, I cannot say for sure what's going to happen. Um, I believe hybrid app development is going to continue to become more and more popular purely because if we can reach a performance of a native application, um, then it just makes sense because it reduces costs overall for for um, for to create a hybrid application if it's as performant as a um, native application. Um, but we don't still have we don't yet have that framework that matches native capability 100%. And I do not know when a, a framework like that will come. Um, but what I would suggest is if you want to become an iOS developer, learn iOS first, um, learn Swift, become a good iOS developer. But always keep an eye out for, for a technology that might disrupt the space. And Flutter might be the technology. It's not yet the technology. Um, we still have to wait for it to uh, become more performant and become more popular for it to replace native development. But I would suggest to stick to iOS development for now. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Well, and um, adding to that particular topic, I I personally have one question uh, about about choosing this uh, hybrid versus iOS. I heard from uh, friends, and I do personally have uh, experiences that there are few limitations in in uh, hybrid development as well, like you know controlling the uh, the hardware elements of uh, the device specifically. So. Um, uh, does does is that really true, or what do you see your opinion on that part? Right. Um, I'll take Flutter as an example because I feel it's one of the best hybrid development tools. Um, even in Flutter, so let's say if, if I want to access a specific hardware feature that has been recently released on uh, the iOS SDK or the Android SDK. Um, let's say now we have a heart sensor, like a heartbeat sensor on our phones. Um, unfortunately, iOS has released it already on their SDKs, and iOS native developers are now able to access this heart, heartbeat detector and use it on the applications. But on Flutter, we don't have that yet, because Flutter has to now take the iOS SDK implementation, the Android SDK implementation, and create a bridge on top of it. Um, now, if that doesn't exist, what we then have to do is build this bridge ourselves, which means that we have to write native code uh, for both Android and iOS, and then use it in uh, Flutter. Um, so that makes things a lot more complicated uh, when you're developing hybrid applications. Uh, it is becoming less and less needed because um, hybrid application is improving. So people are able to update things a lot quicker, um, but that problem still exists. Yeah, cool, cool. So, the, 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 so in, in simple terms, the answer would be, uh, though hybrid uh, wins a lot of space, there are some, some places where the developers need to keep an eye on as well to catch up with the native stuff if needed. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, that's mostly uh, about what we have. And uh, there are one other question that we get is, uh, what tools did you use to learn uh, when you start your um, software development career at the beginning? Right. Um, okay, so this, this is very useful uh, if you haven't um, you know, begun software development yet. Um, and you're looking to get into software development. The tools that I use, I don't know if they're still as popular today, but I use uh, three websites. Um, the first one is Code Academy. Code Academy is what I used to learn syntax, to learn programming language syntax. Um, then I use Udemy. Udemy has a bunch of courses online for any software de developing principles. Um, and what I did was I took a, so for my first internship, I took a web development course. And that's actually how I ended up building um, a website for my internship and that i remember messaging the web development courses instructor and telling him you know i built these websites just because of your course i send the links to the websites and stuff um so that was um you know udemy but a lot of the ios uh, android development uh, i've learned on udacity um let me just link it actually on the chat i have these links ready just so that everyone has it i don't know if everyone can see the chat i hope they can um as long as we post it as uh, visible to panelists and attendees. Right, okay. Okay, so Udacity is what I use to learn native Android development. And I found it great. I think Google is also collaborating with Udacity. Um, so that means their content is usually very up-to-date. I see, cool, yeah. cool. <laughs> Uh, so uh, now, now, uh, since since you you play different roles as as uh, uh, Android web developer uh, together, also you have some experiences in um, interviewing the candidates. So mm -hmm. uh, shall I take the privilege to ask you one question uh, regarding this whole interview? I mean, it's it's not a question, but what would be your uh, you know uh, one tip that you you would give? Of course, Crimson gave a lot, but <laughs> what is the one tip that you might give to um, the participants here? Um, for a tech interview? Um, yes. Okay, so I yes, I have done a, a few iOS tech interviews in the last year at Zonkit. Um, I think one of the most important things is your ability to communicate your uh, knowledge. Um, a lot of times there are a lot of very technical people. And of course we try to find out if they are actually very technical, even though they're not able to communicate it very well. That's something we strive for, but it, it becomes a lot easier if you can easily communicate what you know. Um, and how you do that is by reading, um, blogs about this specific technology. So if you're interested in Android uh, development, if you're interviewing as an Android engineer, I would suggest to spend a lot of time reading blogs about Android development. Um, and listen to the language that they're using to, de to describe certain things. Um, they could talk about architecture. They could talk about uh, design patterns in Android. They could talk about dependency injection. 
these are all terms that you need to be able to use correctly in a tech interview from for someone to be able to understand what you're saying and to really understand that you actually know what you're talking about um also it's important for you to be able to practically uh perform um in in specific rounds so you know uh, let it be um a pair programming session in, in an interview process or it could be a um you know a session where you have to create an application like a coding or coding exercise so be good with code development um make sure you're comfortable with the language and you know i think that's that's probably the best thing you could do for a tech interview Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that's that's exactly the 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 element that should surprise the the participants here. The the the, the terms that we use in the interview. That's that's the key part here. It should mm -hmm. actually be familiar to you and to the um, interviewers as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for this um, uh, topic and insights. Um, I think we are all done here with our questions and. Uh, if we, if you all, uh, if the participants do have any more questions, you can uh, reach out uh, to Prakar in his uh, uh, LinkedIn uh, contact. I hope Prakar would be like enjoying to like <laughs> reply all all the all the questions he may get. Uh, so that's that's all we have, and thank you so much for uh, attending this uh, session. And I was really fun and enjoying to talk to you guys, share our interests and share our uh, knowledges that we gained so far. Um, any word from others? Um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I, it's been a pleasure talking about this. I, I really like talking about myself. So I was happy that I got the opportunity to talk about my story. Um, <laughs> cool. Yeah. I mean, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to contact me on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to help um, in any way possible. Thank you for attending uh, this uh, sharing session and make it happen. Uh, thank you. Have a great weekend. Yeah, same. Have a great weekend, everyone. And um, if you are in the afternoon session, I hope either you should you have completed your lunch or if it is yet, uh, please enjoy your lunch and the rest of the evening. Bye bye. Thank you.